for joining us today. And welcome to Blue Shore Financial's presentation on succession planning, together with our friends from VR Business Advisors and CFO Consulting. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge that this event is being broadcast from the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Today, we'll be discussing succession planning for business owners with insights and ideas and practical tips you can act on when creating and updating your plan, ultimately preparing for your future and the future of your business. Before we get started, there is a number of housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our website at blueshorefinancial.com following the event. You'll be on silent mode and muted during your presentation. You have the option to adjust the volume setting or other settings. There'll be opportunities for you to engage with us and there is a Q&A button that will allow you to submit a question. At the end of the presentation, we will review the questions. There is a poll today where you will be given a moment to answer. We encourage you to engage with us throughout the webinar and write notes on what is most valuable and most helpful for you. There's a survey link at the end of the presentation. Please kindly take a moment to fill it out. I'm delighted to have with me Anna Zilnikova, President and Founder of CFO Consulting and Candace Hartwell, Partner at Fear Business Advisors. Again, I am Anna Plute, Business Advisor with Blue Shore Financial. Our agenda for today, I will go over small business challenges and what succession planning entails. Candace will speak to succession planning strategies and Anna will discuss cash flow to help you plan for your future. Then we will open the floor to questions. What are some of the current challenges for business owners and why start here? Well, it is important where you are and what you're up against so you can plan for the future. I work with many small business owners throughout the region, and there are some issues that are ongoing and some that are new and should be on your radar as well. Pivoting the supply shortages and disruptions, finding resources to pay for the cost of upgrading technology and prioritizing time for digital marketing to enhance brand recognition. But still the biggest challenge is staff shortages. And within that, it could be finding the right skill set, followed by finding the time, the people, the resources to train the new staff, and then ensuring that there's sufficient cash flow to pay for the new employee. The happiest employees I've talked to pride themselves on how long their employees have been with them and how awesome they are. When I ask them how they recruit their new staff, they simply say, my employees find them. Let's take a moment to talk about what a hiring employee entails and what that means for the business. First of all, you need to figure, find the time and understand what kind of skill set you're requiring and the complexity, and then determining the hours that you will need for the employee, whether it's full-time, part-time, on-call, or contract. Some employees mention that it is ideal to have a receptionist that does a little bit of bookkeeping, but these are two different skill sets. Why not explore a part-time receptionist position and offsourcing the bookkeeping work? This way, both jobs are done better. During the time of digital transformation, owners hire staff on a contract basis to help with sorting, scanning, shredding, as this is a temporary need for the business. This would be an ideal job for a summer student or an excellent opportunity for someone establishing themselves in Canada. Businesses that are unable to find talent locally can recruit internationally with the ease of remote work. There are HR specialists that can help you make the decision, write the job description, and there's other recruitment services that can help you find the right person. Once you have found the right addition to your team, it is imperative that the new hire gets ample training. What you have to think about is the existing 
your existing employees trying to make time on their already demanding day. Be creative on how you reward these employees. Listen to what they need, what they value, and you'll be surprised to learn that it's not monetary compensation. Lastly, there are two options for ensuring sufficient funds, sufficient, sorry, sufficient cash flow to pay for the new employees. If the business does not have sufficient cash reserves to pay the wages for the new hire, consider a working capital loan. Also refer to a business line of credit. Calculate the increase in sales and the production that the new employee can bring to offset the cost of wages. The line of credit are very flexible in their limits and repayment options, allowing you to pay as little as interest only for those tight months. Hiring grants is where I refer my clients to granted consulting. Many small business owners find it hard to navigate the maze of available grants. And that is where Get Granted is an easy platform that will help you find the technology that will help you match with the grants. And then there's Granted Started that can help you with the entire process from application to claims. So you can focus on what matters most. If you are unsure about the technicality of calculating and remitting payroll taxes to the government, there are resources available to help you as well. Let us take a moment and talk about employee retention strategies. Competitive salaries and pay equity show employees that they are valued. With the increase of minimum wages to 1740 on 1st of June this year, employers are adjusting their salaries to ensure fairness. And you would be surprised that it is not the monetary compensation, but rest and recognition is what keeps the employees with you. The biggest difference my, my clients and prospects tell me is the vacation. Some of them offer five, week vacation, five weeks of vacation in the first year. And this will allow their employee to travel back home to visit family as the five weeks can be taken together. Whatever the health situation that your employees are in, offering medical and dental, as well as access to health consultants can go a long way. This way, your employee can focus better knowing that they're getting regular assistance, whether it's grief, growth, or stress management. Work flexibility, whether it is workable, work, flexible work schedule, or ability to work from home or close to home is a game changer for professionals trying to balance family and aging parents. Graduate return to work for parents returning from maternity and paternity will also help with the separation anxiety phase for the child and the parent. As well, it'll ensure a smooth transaction into kindergarten or daycare and without prolonged disruptions. This flexibility should also be allowed for employees transitioning their aging parents to a retirement home or coordinating additional help. Perks, also known as culture. Blue Shore has been inducted into the Hall of Fame for our culture. So we're, all, we're always happy to inspire our clients and share our ideas. Culture that we have fosters creativity, autonomy, authenticity, where employees are drawn to their workplaces. They belong there, they're part of a team. Whether it is having lunch together, taking tech, time to recognize fears, celebrating success, taking time to recognize with gift cards, lunches, or just an outing to play. Imagine if selling your business was both a perk and a succession plan. There are two things you need to consider in your succession planning journey. One is the new capital gains tax. We will be having a webinar on this on October 24th, and details are in the registration below. The other is your retirement. 
Retirement and succession planning go hand in hand together. So ensure that you have a team to help you, whether it's a tax accountant, a lawyer, and a wealth professional. They all have insights and strategies and opportunities to ensure that you have a retirement plan in place that will suit your goals. Let's get into defining succession planning. But before we do that, we'd like to know where your succession plan is at. So next we will have a poll. And the question is, what is the status of your business succession plan? Do you have one? It is going to plan. You have one, but it needs work and updating. You've started one, but haven't finished. None at all, or you're unsure. Let's take a moment to gather the answers. Few more minutes for the answers. Excellent. That's perfect. Many of you are unfamiliar with succession planning, so very happy that you're joining this webinar. So please do take notes, and there will be questions that we can answer at the end. So what is succession planning? Succession planning is a process of, of envisioning what the business legacy will be to the reality of passing the business to a potential buyer, whether it's your children or your employees. It's surprising that only 9% of businesses in Canada have a plan, and this is according to the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses in a study from 2023. Typically, this process will take five years, including a business appraisal and finding the right successor, who's right for your clients, your employees, and your community. Keep in mind that when passing a business to your employees, it increases the standard of living for the community. Candace will dive into the options on selling the business to a third party, whether it's a supplier or an investor, or transferring the business to your family members or employees. I'll be handing it over to Candice in a moment. Thanks so much, Anna. And it's interesting that the stats from the survey poll are actually quite similar to across Canada. So you guys can all pat yourselves on the back. You're a great sample size. So my name is Candice Hartwell. I am a CPA. I'm a partner at Beer Business Advisors. We focus on selling businesses, typically smaller businesses in three to $20 million range. We facilitate not only external sales, but also internal ownership transitions, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, now, Anna's comments ring loud and clear with us and our clients. A thoughtful succession plan takes time so that you don't become a statistic. Not only does a business owner need to consider when they ultimately want to sell, but who do you want to sell to? Who is the ideal buyer for your business? And it's not just a numbers game. It's about understanding your own objectives and ensuring that you're making the decisions and taking the actions today that will hopefully move you forward and closer to that succession planning goal you have for you and your business and your family. Um, but there's often one stumbling block. You, the owners are busy running your companies and reckoning with the eventual sale or exit from your business is like reckoning with your own mortality uh, and can seem overwhelming when you're focused on the minutia of day-to-day -day or cash flow. So later in our presentation, we have Anna Solnikova talking uh, a bit more in depth about cash flow and how strategies you take today can help improve the value of your business when you get ready to sell. Uh, now, valuing your business. Uh, our presentation today doesn't go into a deep dive about valuations, but uh, as Anna, Anna Plut said earlier, solving for X, knowing how much your business is worth is an important part of your retirement plan, especially if you are relying on the sale of your business to fund that plan. Is your business worth what you need for that next stage? Uh, or do you have some work to do? Uh, and knowing even more importantly, if it doesn't meet your value expectations, what can you be doing now to increase that value between now and the time you eventually do sell? So valuations 101, 
there are a number of ways to evaluate small businesses. Uh, but for most traditional long-standing small businesses, and I'm not talking startups, uh, businesses that have seen, you know, a, almost a stabilized normal level of activity, normal, I say in quotes, uh, there's typically a formula that we use. And it's based on the company's normalized earnings or profits. We use an acronym called EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization, essentially weaving out any of the numbers that the accountants can kind of manipulate to try to identify what's a, a standard um, cash flow of the business and applying a, multiply, a multiplier to that. So say your EBITDA is $500,000, then we would times that by a multiplier, typically two to six times for small businesses. Uh, if your multiplier is three, easy math, 500,000 times three is one and a half million. But how do buyers determine what that multiplier is? This is the dark art of valuations. Uh, in essence, that multiplier is all about risk. The riskier your business is, the lower that multiplier is, and ultimately the lower the value of your business. And the inverse is true. The less risky your business, the more likely that your business is able to continue gener generating the same level of EBITDA, maybe even higher EBITDA, after you pass the torch to the new owner of the business, the higher the multiplier and thus the higher the value of your business. And some of the things that can increase that multiplier are things that increase, uh, not only reduce the risk in your business, but help you work more on it versus in the weeds of your business. Things like implant, implementing recurring revenue models or increasing the customer loyalty, sticky recurring customers, building a competitive advantage that's difficult for your competitors to duplicate, and even more important, that your customers are willing to pay a premium for, uh, reducing your dependence on your key suppliers or your key customers, that you have lots of customer diversification, and very importantly, building up your management team so that if you don't show up to work one day, the business can still operate without you. Uh, later, in the uh, later in the presentation today, Anna Solnikova will talk about the importance of data, financial metrics in your business, and having readily available information that can allow a new business, uh, new owner, the new owner of your business, um, uh, have access to that data to make great decisions instead of having that information locked up in your head and very happy to take more questions about valuations later in the presentation. Now, if I could draw out the fantasy of most small business owners, uh, most, uh, it might go something like this in regards to the eventual sale of your business. You don't need to spend the time working on an uncomfortable succession plan. You just continue working hard day to day. And one beautiful day, the clouds part. Uh, someone from your industry emerges and they say they want to buy your business for a whack of cash. They drop it on your desk and they just, all you have to do is hand over the keys. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't usually go like that. But however, if you do spend the time now to consider who you want to sell for and why and start taking steps now in how you operate your business. Uh, business owners have the opportunity to achieve more than just your financial objectives. Uh, depending on who you sell to, there are opportunities to preserve the business's legacy, maintain opportunities for your staff, maybe even reward your key people for the work they put in over the years. Broadly speaking, there are two general groups of buyers. There are those that are outside your business and those that are already within the inner circle. And I thought I'd spend a little bit of time today talking about each one of those and the pros and cons of each and what you might need to consider if one type of these buyers appeal to you. Uh, great. So. Uh, strategic buyers, what do we mean by strategic buyers? Someone in your value chain, they might be a customer, a supplier, maybe even a competitor. They might be someone that does your line of business, but maybe in Eastern Canada, and they're looking to build out their Western Canadian uh, presence. Typically it's someone that sees that by joining forces with you, one plus one can equal more than two. Um, they can access 
value creation opportunities by partnering with you. They can not only see cost saving synergies on the back end, but they can also cross sell. Maybe they're bundling, maybe they can scale faster by um, merging or acquiring your business. Uh, they might be looking to acquire some skills. Maybe you have some proprietary technology or processes in your business, some secret sauce that they want to uh, acquire and extend to their group of businesses. Uh, one interesting increasing type of acquisition we're seeing now is we'll call it an aqua hire, a business looking to buy another simply to have access to their talent pool, to have access to their team, because it's easier to buy a business with employees already there than to go out and, and, uh, and hire employees one by one. Uh, now, some buyers might even buy you just to prevent a competitor from buying you. Uh, so there's lots of interesting motivations for these buyers. Um, but it is important to consider that if you're going to start dancing with your competitor, you want to make sure that you're keeping your proprietary information, your secret sauce, your cards close to your chest until you're very certain this deal is going to close. So during due diligence, you might choose to anonymize your customer names. You might not want to share the names of your staff or what you pay them yet until you are very certain this deal is closing and maybe at the 11th hour. That's when you finally disclose uh, and to keep that information confidential in case your deal with a strategic buyer does not close. Uh, private equity buyers or PE buyers, uh, this is definitely a growing group uh, internationally. Typically, they're looking for businesses with $5 million in EBITDA or greater. Essentially, it's investors pooling their money to seek higher returns in the private markets than what is available in the public markets. And the often formula they use is using as little of their own money as possible, borrow as much as they can from the bank at cheap rates, uh, because money was previously on sale, uh, rates coming down, uh, increase the profitability while they own the business, and then flip or sell that, uh, that investment in maybe five to eight years from now. Uh, theoretically, they will flip it for more than what they, they bought it for, uh, and then return those, those uh, funds or proceeds to their investors. So they set out to make acquisitions based on an investment thesis. They might be looking for plumbing companies with 50 plus staff that provide commercial services, for example. And they'll be looking to roll up more of those types of businesses to focus on efficiencies, add some professionalization, add processes so that when they ultimately sell, uh, they've increased the value and operating efficiency of the businesses that they've acquired. Uh, now, especially in the states right now, private equity firms have a bad reputation often for cost cutting or cutting staff or relocating, but not all private equity firms are created uh, equal. You know, there's even some in Vancouver here that uh, coin themselves as evergreen funds or forever holds, meaning their investors are more patient. They are not looking for that traditional five to eight year flip. They're willing to be more patient and own a business over the long term because they see benefit in owning a business um, rather than flipping it in a, in a shorter time period. Now, this is important for you if you're considering private equity as a buyer. They do pay, um, they pay well. Um, but they want to ensure that there's a strong management team in place. They don't want to operate the business. They want to be the board of the directors. They don't want to be the general manager. So they're looking for businesses that have strong leadership that will stay after the business owner sells. If you are the leadership team, then they'll probably require you to provide uh, a transition period, one, two, maybe more years. They often also want the sellers to have some skin in the game or the management team to have some skin in the game. They want them to own a part of the business. So the private equity firm might own between 60 to 80% of the business, but they want the sellers and the continuing management ownership team to, to own a minority stake so that they create alignment, that you're just as motivated to continue growing that business um, as they are as well. Now, entrepreneurial financial buyers often looking for smaller businesses uh, following a period of low interest rates. There's been a lot of liquidity in private markets, people locally that have made a lot of home equity. They've decided they're tired of working for the man. They want to be their own boss. Uh, they love the idea of being a business owner, uh, but they don't have a great startup idea. So 
instead of starting up a business, why not buy one? Why not buy one from a, a business owner that's looking to retire uh, and continue operating that business as is, maybe take it from good to great. Um, they can be a, a buyer that's looking to own and operate the business for long term. So for business owners that are looking to maintain legacy, uh, often these buyers are looking to carry on the, the brand, carry on the business name, continue offering the same employment opportunities for, to your staff. And this can be uh, quite appealing to small business owners. The catch though, is that often there's gonna be some vendor financing required. Vendor financing essentially is an IOU. Uh, a business buyer or a financial buyer might structure a business acquisition like this. They'll put in some of their own money, they'll go to the bank, they'll go to Blue Shore and say, I wanna borrow as much money as you'll lend me. And then the balance for the, the remainder that they can't borrow, uh, they'll ask the business owner to, to finance them, IOU. They'll pay them over time and typically they'll pay them from future proceeds of the business. So after the bank is paid is typically when the vendor will be paid. So when you're considering selling to this type of buyer, as much as they're gonna be doing due diligence on you and your business, you want to be confident that you're going to be doing, able to do sufficient due diligence on them as an operator, as a money manager, as uh, you know, will they have winning conditions to not only operate your business after you leave, but to do so uh, f in a financially secure way so that they can not only pay, repay the bank loan, but also repay you, the vendor. They might also want a longer transition period to learn the ropes. Uh, now, a very uh, interesting, um, you know, where we're seeing a lot of growth in our business is the sale to possible uh, employee buyers. We'll hear from business owners that say, yeah, my staff would be great owners and operators of this business, but they can't afford me. Uh, yeah, that's usually true. Your employees or management team often don't have a whack of cash burning a hole in their pocket, ready to, to pay all cash and closing for a business. But if your leadership team have uh, operation, uh, independent operation potential, they have great relationships with your customers, with your suppliers, with your employees. Uh, if the only reason you wouldn't want to sell to your team is because they can't afford you, then there are lots of really creative ways to structure uh, an employee buyout over time. It can be phased. There's no set way of doing these transactions transactions in Canada, which is very cool. You know, we tell our clients we're only limited by our creativity and coming up with a structure that works. Now, this doesn't work for every owner. You know, if you're looking for all your cash on closing and leaving the keys on the desk, then selling to your employees might not be uh, what achieves your objectives. But if you're willing to be patient because you see the opportunities for legacy maintenance, if you're willing to maybe be a little generous with uh, offering vendor financing to your team, your team buys you out over time, um, then there's definitely opportunities to create win-win scenarios. Uh, also in Canada, very exciting this year is recently launched uh, uh, legislation regarding employee ownership trusts, which are popular, there's po um, similar models in the US and UK for uh, transitioning your, the ownership of a business to um, the employees by way of an ownership trust. Uh, and the great thing about it is there's some cr very cool tax incentives for business owners. Now it's not for everyone. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that, but happy to take questions later. Um, but it's great to see that the Canadian government is seeing the benefit of uh, and the importance of ensuring our small businesses continue operating, continue providing employment, and can be a great way to distribute wealth to, to the, the hardworking employees in our economy. So as you embark on your succession planning journey, uh, truly, we think one of the most important first steps is really to get clear on what your objectives are, uh, to know where you're headed and know what does life after exit look for you? What does it feel like? Do you have family that you want to stay active in the business? Have you talked about your family objectives? Do you want to sell to the highest bidder, no matter the terms, no matter how they plan to operate your business? Or would you be willing to maybe take a little bit of a haircut knowing you're selling to the right buyer? 
do you want to, or are you prepared to stay active in the business for some period of time? That might either open opportunities for the different types of buyers that are available to you or limit them. Uh, are you prepared to partially finance the purchase price uh, via a vendor note? And I would say for nearly every sale of a small business, a vendor note or an IOU is required. Um, will the proceeds of the sale of your business be enough to fund the next phase of your life, including your retirement? Uh, how soon are you looking to be emotionally, intellectually, and financially divorced from your business? If it's ASAP, then maybe selling to your family or your management team might not achieve that objective. And also, what scares or excites you about you know, exiting your business? What's pulling you, drawing you from your business versus pushing you out of it? And if there are major issues pushing you from your business, you may want to address those issues first to increase the sellability and hopefully also the value of your business before you exit. And so now uh, the overarching theme throughout that is that cash flow is super important for uh, not only operating your business day to day, but the valuation. So with cash flow in mind, I'm gonna hand over the mic to Anna Solnikova. Thank you so much, Candace. What a wonderful recap of all the different exit strategies and options and why cash flow matters. So when we're thinking about um, securing and sustaining cash flow, and especially as it pertains to um, wanting to have that exit strategy, it is about reducing that risk factor. One of the risk factors that a potential buyer will be looking at is whether or not the business can sustain itself from the inflow and outflow of, of cash going through the bank account. So there are really three major types of uh, sources of cash flow. You have your operations, which really is just your sales and the collection of those sales. Um, and um, there are also investments that you can look at as a way of having reoccurring deposits into your bank account uh, from, um, from the interest or dividends of those investments. And then lastly, we have financing. So this would be, for example, the uh, revolving line of credit um, that Anna Plu talked about earlier, or maybe a mortgage if you're wanting to consider a, a larger expenditure such as a building or a, a big piece of machinery. So a lot of times my clients are a little bit perplexed as to the difference between cash flow and net income. So they're very much similar, but also hugely different in many regards. So cash flow really is just the dollar signs coming in and out of your bank account. And unfortunately, a lot of business owners, especially if they're in the small or medium size, just look at their balance at the end of the day in their bank account as to whether or not their business is doing well. And while this may be a good strategy for a very small business, I would caution business owners to have a bigger picture approach to this because just because your, your bank account says you have $10,000 today, that may not be the case when you wake up tomorrow. If you have issued payments, if you have uncleared checks, if you have outstanding obligations that you're not taking into consideration when managing your cash flow, um, that could be potentially dangerous for a business owner. And really the word of, of key importance there is the management. Are you managing your cash flows? Do you have a full picture of what is going on with the money coming in and out of your business? And net income is indifferent in that it is the profit of the business. And this is kind of where um, Candace was talking about the numbers that the accountants can sometimes fiddle with. So you have your true revenue. These are the sales that you have made. These are the invoices you've issued to your clients. Um, and then you have, of course, you have your expenses, but you also have those accounting line items such as your depreciation um, and other factors that don't necessarily impact your your bank account, but are important for matters such as taxes, et cetera. So all of this matters when you're thinking of your succession plan, because a potential buyer will want to know whether or not the business can sustain itself from healthy cash flow coming in and out of the business, but also what is the net income, the profit at the end of the fiscal year or the quarter. So both are important, but matter for different reasons. So when we're thinking of the different cash flow management strategies, um, one of the, the big pieces that we use in managing and uh, projecting for cash flow are budgets. So we want to anticipate as much as we can. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball into the future, but we do want to try and anticipate our expenses and also be cognizant of the investments we want to make in the business. One of the most dangerous things you can do when you're thinking of selling and thinking of your exit strategy is taking your foot off the pedal too soon. So you want to continue running that business 
from the mindset of, I will be in it for the next five to 10 years, even if you're thinking of selling. So you don't want to signal to the potential buyer um, that you haven't been putting a lot of equity or investment or growth into the business leading up to the sale. Um, and that can actually limit the potential for an exit strategy or the value of your business. So don't take your foot off the pedal too soon. Another key factor is really being cognizant of how you as the owner or you as the management team are compensating yourself. There are different strategies. Of course, you can have your salary, you can have dividends, or potentially you have repayment of shareholder loans. So all of those three things will matter to a potential buyer. And again, we'll signal to them the strength of the cash flow and the profitability of the business when they're entertaining whether or not they should acquire your business or buy into it. You also want to, on the flip side of that equation, estimate your inflows. So your revenues versus your cash received. So a lot of my clients fall um, in the pitfall of, I'm so excited, my revenues grew 200% this year, but how much of that was actually received? So if you have great sales and great revenues, but your, your collectability rate is low, that could potentially spell disaster for cash flow and the long-term longevity of that business and also the appeal for a potential buyer. So you want to routinely compare your actuals to your budgets. You want to see six months ago, where did you think you were going to be at this point in time? And not only assess whether or not you hit those targets or whether or not your projections were correct or close enough, but why? Why were you over or under? And use those opportunities as a learning opportunity um, to reassess, uh, revise your budget and learn from those opportunities and those misses um, and just fine tune your budgeting and your forecast uh, for the future. You can also um, use financing as a way to increase your, your cash inflow. So for example, for a short term, um, say you, like Anna Plut was mentioning, you are looking to hire new staff and perhaps you don't have the cash flow on hand to support those um, salaries. You can take on a revolving line of credit, which often comes with great flexibility uh, that allows you to draw on it or pay it down as frequently as you wish, of course, up to your limit. So if that is something of interest to you, definitely talk to Anna at Blue Shore about that. And then similarly for long term, so these would be your capital outlays. This would be the purchase of a building. Perhaps you're looking to expand your operations and you're looking to purchase another factory, another facility. Uh, you're looking to take on um, significant machinery, equipment. Those type of large assets uh, should probably be financed through a mortgage over the long term useful life of those assets that are supporting that loan. And again, I'm sure Anna would be more than happy to tell you about all the different options. So when you're thinking of mitigating your business risk, this is really where we try to, as much as possible, anticipate positive as well as negative events that may impact the cash flow and profitability of the business. So see some of the unexpected events could be such as large contracts being signed or canceled, and both could be an issue. At first you think, oh, wow, I'm signing a large contract. How exciting. But the pitfall of that is, do you have the talent, the people? Do you have the resources? Do you have the physical inventory and facility to cope with that contract? Because if you say yes to this client and don't follow through, of course, the reputational damage of that could be huge. And similarly, if you've hitched, you know, if you've hitched your wagon to one major client and that represents 75% of your revenue, and all of a sudden that that contract uh, that contract cancels, what will that mean for your profitability, for your revenues, for your cash flow, for just the sustainability and um, future of your business. So those are the sort of key things we want to think about when we're trying to mitigate business risk. You also want to consider the credit worthiness of your clients. So if you've taken on the significant contract, you have determined that you have all the resources and talent in place to fulfill this contract, is that client credit worthy? If they have signed on for a million dollar contract, will they actually be able to pay their bills on time and in full? Because if not, that again could negatively impact your cash flow and your profitability and could put your business at risk of not being appealing to a buyer and could put you further off course toward your succession plan. And lastly, just like in your personal life, you want to stay for a rainy day. You want to make sure, as Candace mentioned, and Anna as well, that you have cash reserves on hand for those unexpected events that come up like COVID-19, nobody really saw that coming, but we all had to deal with it. So you want to have a little bit of reserve for those unexpected rainy days. 
But when it comes to cash management uh, and cash flow management, it really it comes down to your revenues versus how quickly and effectively you can collect on those revenues. So you want to invoice early and collect quickly. So you want to have very clear invoices that leave no questions or uncertainties for the payee, for the customer, as to what this invoice is for and whether or not it's fair. You want to be very clear with your payment terms. So oftentimes you'll see net 15 or net 30 due upon receipt. And all of that should be coming from the contract that you have with your client so that there are no disagreements or uncertainties as to what that will look like. If you're in a business that requires you to outlay a lot of cash up front, say for example, you're in the construction business or you're a photographer or any kind of service-based business where you yourself will have to outlay a lot of money before you collect, I would strongly advise you look at retainers and deposits. Make sure that the client has some skin in the game, that they've already paid 50% of your invoice before you've ever even um, started the work for them. And this is fairly standard. The other thing that you may want to use as a cash flow management strategy is discounts. Say, for example, a client is willing to pay you within two business days versus 20 business days. You may want to incentivize uh, to collect early within two business days by giving a small discount. Because if you're a multi multi-million dollar organization that has millions of dollars flowing through your bank account every single day, if you collect quickly, you can then take that money and invest it and actually make money off of those investments. So those are some of the strategies and I'm happy to answer more questions later on as to what they what they are, but it really depends on the nature of your business. And as Candace mentioned, what are your long-term aspirations for your business? You want to demonstrate healthy ongoing cash flow so that you're appealing to the potential buyer. Also, as you're thinking of your exit strategy, you want to keep a close eye on your cost and inventory. So this is called your working capital. You want to keep that as tight as possible in probably the two to five years leading up to your exit, your, your ideal uh, sale of your business. So you want to constantly be reviewing your profitability. You want to be keeping a very close eye on your accounts receivable and accounts payable. And if you are a small entity, you probably are looking at that on a monthly basis. If you're a medium or large size company, you're probably looking at that daily or possibly weekly. You want to review and update your projections regularly. So you constantly want to be gauging where did I think I was going to be versus where I am and why, and how do I learn from that and sharpen my, my projections even more going forward. And as I mentioned, you want to keep your working capital tight. So your working capital is your current assets, which when you're looking at your balance sheet, that's your cash, your accounts receivable, and your inventory, items that are already are liquid or are fairly easy to liquidate. And then from that, we deduct the current liabilities. So those are your accounts payable, so the obligations you have to your vendors, and also the interest on the short-term debt. So if you have a revolving line of credit, every month, Bosher Financial is going to expect that you make some sort of payment, and that would be part of your current liabilities. So that equation, your current assets minus your current liabilities, you really want to keep that very tight because that will signal to a potential buyer as to how tight and good your working capital is, which will support their decision whether or not you are a good investment and a good acquisition. And as Candace mentioned, really in managing your cash flow and just running your company from a good financial stance, the financial health of your business, numbers and data are key. Uh, it's a tricky balance to figure out how much data is too much. You can definitely become paralyzed by, you know, the paralysis by analysis definitely is a thing. You don't want to have so much red tape and so much data that you're swimming in it and it's not useful. So it depends really on the industry and the size of your business and your ultimate goal, your exit strategy, your succession plan that will determine what type of tools are right for you. So choosing and using the right tool for you and your business um, is key. So you can look at business management tools such as the enterprise resource planning. We often see this in medium and larger size entities. For small companies, I do find that this is overkill, but again, only you know what's best for you. Uh, the standalone accounting software, I'm a big believer in QuickBooks Online. It is a fantastic, easy to use, very small learning curve, and it has fantastic dashboards. So when you log in, you can see exactly where your cash flow is at that particular day, uh, what your revenues, your expenses are doing, trending on a monthly basis or whatever you decide to use as your benchmark. And of course, if you want more sophisticated, more thorough information and data points, you can uh, look into cash flow planners. There are Excel-based ones, as well as subscription-based ones. Um, and so much, uh, so many tools available out there. It's just about finding out which ones are the best ones. So as Candace mentioned, Candace mentioned you want to make sure that your information is presented in a clear, 
easy to read and reliable manner. I see so many clients that come to me wanting to have due diligence on a seller and we can't even get the basics, such as a quarterly income statement. Um, so we really can't figure out whether or not this decision makes sense. So you want to make sure that you're always comparing whatever periods you decide month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year, have clear, concise apples to apples comparisons for anyone that's coming into your business, not knowing anything about it, and looking at the cash flow, the profitability, the working capital, just the overall success of your business from a financial point of view, equip them with that information so that they can make a clear and easy decision about the profitability and um, value of your business. And that is all for me. Thank you so much, Anna and Candice. Thank you for having us. It's just such wonderful insights. Just wanted to recap, you know, succession planning is all, you know, all about your future, your legacy, your retirement, lengthy and complex process. So do take the time. Like I said, it takes, you know, typically um, five years. Um, you know, it's an inclusive process. So, you know, do discuss it with your family, your employees, your stakeholders. And, you know, if you ever need help, please do reach out. Um, to any of us. I say, you know, thank you for joining us and we will now move into our Q&A session. Thank you so much for taking the time to submit the question. Our first question is for Candace. Candace, is there a tangible way to identify and lower risk as a seller? Uh, tangible ways, certainly. So maybe less so on the fuzzy, you know, the business model of what you do every day and more into, um, I jump back into what Anna was saying about really great financial information. That is absolutely a must. If you are currently not able to prepare a monthly financial statement that shows uh, on a, an accounting basis how your business is profitable month to month, Without that minimum information, it will be very difficult to uh, sell your business. Uh, and then also I would ask yourself, when's the last time you took a three week vacation from your business? How did it operate without you? That's an intangible question, but it drills down to the tangibles. It means if you are not, if you are still not redundant in your business, what are the things that you can do now to make sure you're removing yourself from, from the business. You want to reduce the personal goodwill, the reliance on yourself, because a buyer cannot buy you, and you want to transfer that to business goodwill. So are your processes and procedures documented? If you didn't show up uh, tomorrow, do, does your team know uh, how to operate the business day to day? Are all roles clearly defined? Are you doing the equivalent of five different roles or de different departments? Or are there clear designations between which staff member handles what? Is every staff member coming to you or do they have the empowerment to be able to operate the business uh, on their own? I would say documenting procedures, having that data are great uh, maybe we'll call them low-hanging low-hanging fruit in terms of what you can start to do immediately to start reducing risk in your business. Uh, and then from, uh, I would suggest an approach of mitigating risk first. Once you fill the holes uh, in your business, then you can focus on those value drivers, those opportunities to further uh, drive value. Thank you, Candice have a second question and I can answer a little bit and I would love some feedback from from Candace and Anna uh, the question is how do I find if my employees are interested in buying the business and what is the best way to start the conversation um, I think in what I've learned from from my clients it's all about culture right if you're close to your employees um, if you have you know have discussions about the future of the business, how to make it better, things to improve. I think this is, you know, the best segue to uh, to start the conversation of thinking, you know, I am retiring, this is what I'm looking forward to. And, you know, I, I'd like to stay on, you know, maybe, you know, 
one day, maybe two, or maybe you'd like to do, a, you know, just a gradual exit, you know, five, four, three, two, one, and over the years. And this is where you can gauge, you know, your employees. Some of them might not be ready now, but this is something they want to do in five years. Candice, Anna, would you like to add something? Um, I might jump in too that having it as part of your annual review process with your staff, asking them maybe something like, have you ever thought of being a business owner? Um, now, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner is not for everyone. Um, there's something different in the DNA of Canada's entrepreneurs. And most likely, if your staff are interested in ownership, uh, if they've got that kind of DNA, they've already told you they're interested in ownership. Uh, we find if we work with businesses where they want to sell to the staff and we start meeting with them and their motivation is more job preservation, they want to keep their job after the employer, um, you know, retire or after the business owner retires, that might not be good enough. That might not be sufficient drive, passion and interest to operate a business, to go from being an employee collecting a paycheck to being the business owner or one of a group of business owners responsible for payroll, responsible for revenues. Um, there's a lot of risk that comes with the benefits of ownership and it's definitely um, a conversation that can't be taken lightly. Our approach is uh, when we meet with a potential employee group, if we can't scare them out of the idea of ownership, then they're probably ready for it. But if we highlight some of the risks that are inherent in owning, uh, you know, running a business day to day, uh, if that is a little bit too risk, you know, if they're too risk averse for that, then that's neither good nor bad. We just want to know that information up front so that if those employees are not the right successors for your business, either you're going to hire your buyer, you might find someone, recruit someone that's motivated by equity to have them buy in over time, or you might explore other exit options for your business. And I'll just uh, chime in briefly, if I may, Anna. Um, I agree with everything that you and Candace said. I think it really comes down to having transparent and open communication with your leadership team, management team, and ultimately then your sub-managers and your employees. You know, ideally, whatever organization, regardless of the size and the industries, you're having at least annual strategic planning sessions where you are sharing how your business is doing, the trajectory, your desires and goals and wishes for that business if you are at the sole owner. And as part of that, feeling out uh, the people in the room as to how they feel about that succession plan, that direction of the business, and at what level and at what timeline they want to participate in that. So oftentimes it's just a conversation and it doesn't have to be a big, scary schedule an hour meeting and put everybody on the spot. It can be casual over a few months, over coffees or lunches, but just have the conversation because without it, you won't know. Anna Plut, do we have any other questions? she's having issues with her uh, with her audio, I can read the next one. Uh, I think this one's for you, Candice. I was planning on passing my business to my children. They're pursuing different careers outside of the business, but another family member is interested. How can I pass the business to this family member, but make sure my children benefit from it as well? Mm -hmm. Family dynamics, very uh, unique to every family business. Um, transparency is key. So um, making sure you're having those conversations as awkward as they may be about your plans for the business uh, with your children. Um, if there is one family member, you know, you want to make sure you're making that decision because it's the right decision uh, for your business. They're the right success for, successor uh, rather than maybe a nepotistic reason. Yes, it's always great to pass on. Uh, keep the business within the family. Um, but we recently helped a business owner that it was a 50 year business. Uh, they had planned, they took it over from dad and their plan was to sell to the sons, but the son said, we just don't want it. And um, you know, that can be a little bit heartbreaking, but it might be more heartbreaking to transition that business to a family member that doesn't want it. And the succession doesn't go as planned. So I would definitely say, um, Certainly, there's ideas of you, you want to equalize. Uh, I'm assuming this family member is another child. Um, 
but you want to equalize the benefits that your children receive from the business. And so if there's maybe a discount on buying in for one, that you equalize that for the others. But there's also, you know, um, some financial literacy about valuing a business. Just because you gave your child, say, um, an opportunity to buy into the business or they were, you know, however you transition the shares, that value changes year to year rather than if you were to give a lump sum of money to your other children. So, you know, important conversations can be had, perhaps in con uh, conjunction with, you know, your tax advisor or accountant, as well as your retirement planner to talk about uh, the pros and cons between, you know, taking an early advance on your inheritance or waiting to your inheritance versus getting shares of, um, of, an, of your family business now. Um, there is no set way of doing this, um, and there are lots of nuances to this. So I would definitely suggest if transitioning to your family is in the cards for you, reach out to um, your tax advisor because there are another number of tax traps and pitfalls when you sell to a, biz a family member that you'll want to be planning for now to make sure you're not paying the tax man any more than he deserves. Awesome. That's a great answer. I There's another one here that I think maybe we can both chime in on. So uh, the question is from uh, Ken Ashley. What is the process if you want to just close your business and use the money in your bank account for retirement income? So I can speak a little bit to uh, tax and tax planning and advice is definitely not in my wheelhouse. But I would say that it comes down to limiting your tax obligation. So you want to go about this in a very methodical way, the timing and the frequency of pulling those funds out of your business account and putting it into an RSP or into your own personal account, um, that will greatly impact how the business and you yourself are taxed. Um, from a logistical point of view, Candace, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, no, there's, um, it's definitely a great option too for many smaller business owners. Um, and so making sure you're working with your um, financial planner as well to ensure um, what your investments are, are tax efficient. Does it make sense to leave that fund in the business or to transfer it to you personally? Um, having those conversations with both your wealth advisor and a tax specialist will be really important. Again, because we don't want to pay more taxes than we need to. Exactly. It's about tax planning, not tax avoidance, yeah. right? That yeah, is tax planning. <laughs> tax planning, not avoidance. Yeah. That is how you keep yourself um, in the good books with CRA and your accountant. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Do we um, do we have any other questions? Uh, that is all the questions. Excellent. And unfortunately, Anna Plut from, from Blue Shore is having a little bit of technical trouble. So maybe we can just uh, finish up the session here, Candice, if you're comfortable with that. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It was lovely, lovely to meet the, the Blue Shore committee here. Yes. Thank you all to, to all the wonderful participants we had. Hopefully you found this uh, webinar of value. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to Anna Plut at Blue Shore or to Candice at Veer uh, Advisors or myself at CFO Consulting. And until next time, thank you very much. Thank you.